afternoon and welcome to another episode of Conversations in the Den. Um, today we will be continuing with um, the second part of our question and answer. Um, as last week we were not able to answer all the questions that were asked. We encourage you to continue to send in your questions because we are here to um, inform and, and teach and, and we would like to give you as much information as we can. Yeah, we do. Um, so thank you for sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. Fantastic. Yeah, so Marie is absolutely right. We do have a few more to answer today. Um, for folks who are thinking as they're beginning to listen to this, that they already have a question in mind, you can send that to conversations in the den at gmail.com. Um, I'm Alicia. I'm the all, pretty much the one who's always checking those emails. So if you do send anything, we'll always try to have those answered within a couple of episodes for you. Um, so the first question, and I think we ended on this note last time as well, is why do stroke survivors feel so alone? Mm. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm going to share from my own experience, and, mm. and I, I know Maria will share from her. I, I think part of it is, um, I think one of the things, that, let me tell you a story. Um, when I left the hospital, I went into outpatient. And I remember when I was discharged from outpatient, the occupational therapist, she, gave, she handed me a flyer and she said, um, you know, Jennifer, this group is called the Hamilton Young Stroke Survivors Group. And they meet once a month, you might benefit from this. And I took the flyer and in my head, I was going, I don't do groups. I'm just gonna put this in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm not a group girl, you know, like, you know, thank you, but no, that. but I never said it out loud. I just took the flyer politely and I, I put it in the car and then I got home and I put it on the fridge. Um, I wouldn't go to attend a meeting of the Hamilton Young Stroke Survivors Group for months. When I finally attended one meeting, I remember, I, I, and, and again, I was suffering really badly with fatigue. Um, you know, I was just really in, a, in a, a really, really low spot in my recovery. And I sat down and I'm not sure if it was three or four or five of us there. And there were some Hamilton Health Sciences, um, you know, support groups, support um, staff there as well. And I was 20 minutes or so into the meeting and I was done like dinner. The fatigue had set in and my brain was shutting down, but I was given permission to leave whenever I want. And so, you know, the group, the group leader said, look at, you know, um, if you feel like leaving after 10 minutes, just leave, go home, go to bed, whatever it is you need to do, you need mm -hmm. to go ahead and do that. But I remember leaving there and I go, wow, this is amazing. They're just like me. And I remember <laughs> they spoke my language. They, um, they understood when I couldn't explain, they understood um, nobody there misunderstood each other. We got it. And I remember leaving and going, holy smokes, I should have come a long time ago. The thing is, is that with stroke survivors, we have a different language that we speak. And the language goes sort of like this. This is our brain. This is stroke on top of our brain. And we are trying to get the answers out. You remind this, me of that. This is your, that commercial. This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but see, you see how hard it is to get answers out. We got to go through all of this brain damage right here because this is like stroke brain damage. We got to go through all of this to figure out what we want to say. And, and, and then we got to get it to our mouths and our brain to say it. And so people often um, mistake stroke survivors for being um, antisocial. Um, not interested in conversating, um, not interested in what is being said to them. Um, a lot of times they think we are, we are distracted and not interested, but it's not true. It's none of the above. We are simply trying to find the answers to get it out. So we feel very alone. We feel very alone because nobody comes there with us. Nobody waits for us to get the words out. Nobody waits for us to try and find the answers to the questions that they're asking. Um, nobody, um, you know, looks at us like we uh, know what we're doing. People look at us like we don't know what we're doing and we've, we've lost the screw somewhere. And so we feel that, we sense that when people 
are waiting too long for an answer and they're getting anxious, we have a very tender spirit. We sense that. So yes, we feel alone because we can't seem to communicate the way we did before. Okay, but... I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the reason why I initially felt alone was because I, you know, this is something that, stroke is not something that happens gradually, like, like cancer or another illness. It's something that happens instantly. Yeah. And so the people who saw you yesterday as your normal self, you know, they still expect you to be the same person after your stroke because they haven't had time to adapt. And so all of those people now think they, they don't have any clue how to deal with you. They don't have a clue. Um, okay, if you're in a wheelchair, well, how am I going to um, take her somewhere? How am I going to um, interact with her? You know, in my home, because their home may not be accessible. You know, and so people tend to just leave you out. And so, yes, people do feel isolated um, because you are not put in a, in a position where you are still interacting with the people that you interacted before your stroke. Because they're still, they're still transitioning into the new awareness of who you now are. I agree. And I think people lose a lot of friends that way and family, you know, I mean, I remember one family member saying to me, you know, even three years later, you know, saying to me, you know, because my hands and my feet work. And um, the family member said to me, um, you didn't have a stroke. You are just pretending because you want sympathy. So there's nothing wrong with you. There's no reason you shouldn't be in a job. And this was like three years later. And so uh, the, the people have the different perceptions of people that have had a stroke and whether their hands and feet work. So, you know, yeah, hence people, the- People don't understand there are very different, there are various different types of strokes. There are brain bleeds, there are clots, you know, I mean, there's different types of strokes and, they, and depending on what kind of um, treatment you get initially and how quickly you get that treatment, you it, it affects how much you're affected yeah yeah absolutely absolutely but you know uh, to, to wrap up the question of, of feeling alone you know it's it's two parts it's the people like like maria said you know it's two parts it's the, it's the friends that don't understand anymore and the family that don't understand anymore and then it's the it's us you know we can't just we can't function like we did before and so we can't get it out as quickly as you want us to get it out so we can communicate effectively but yeah that's that's my take Mm -hmm. I think it's great that we have two different takes and I'm sure others who are listening out there can relate and yeah. it really leads into the next question which is how do you still enjoy life after a stroke? Mm. You know my, my husband used to say this thing to everybody including our four children he said I can't do because my husband's a stroke survivor as well my husband used to say I can't do a lot but I will do a lot of what I can do I can't do a lot, but I'll do a lot of what I can do. And so he would be the one to tell you, I make seven things and I make seven things. I cook, I, I, I cook seven things really well. And if, if you want to come for dinner, these are the seven things on the menu, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, we enjoyed life really, really well. We had very limited funds. We learned about places like, um, you know, coupons and Groupon and um, the entertainment book online and, and the entertainment book in, uh, in person. We, um, we would watch sales. We were given a small freezer for our apartment. So we bought meat on sale. Um, we entertained our families with everything we bought, you know, on, on sale. Um, so that's the financial part of it is that we enjoyed, we still enjoyed entertaining because while, while we didn't have enough money we learned how to entertain with a budget. And so we would do entertaining with a budget. We still lived entertaining like that. Um, cooking for a, a meal for four or five people is hard. You have to cook in stages. So you have to figure out a menu that you can prepare some of it uh, two or three days before so that on the day of, you're only making one thing. So where it comes to entertaining, we entertained in that category and like that because we no longer had the strength to make a whole meal on, you know, on the same day. Mm -hmm. Traveling, we actually, we, we bought a car that was specifically good on gas because we knew we couldn't afford airline, air, airfare. 
So we said, look it, we're going to travel. We're going to drive everywhere. We're going to drive to Vegas. We're going to drive every, uh, all over the States. We're going to drive all over Canada. But this car has to have be good on gas. So we bought a car that was good on gas. We spent a little extra and we got the extra warranty that took care of our travel. Um, personally enjoying life. I think, um, I think you have to, um, you have to decide that there is still life after stroke. And once you make that decision yes. that there is still life after stroke, then That's you will- That's going to go with it. Yeah, you um, have to go with it. Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Go ahead, Maria. I found that um, I initially in the very beginning, you know, it took a, it took a few minutes because, you know, you ask your, you, you're kind of asking yourself, why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. So you have to go through the stages. And after I had my moment, um, I realized there has to be a purpose. And so that uplifted me because I finding that purpose was what, what kept me happy. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, you know, um, what can I do to help? What can I do? You know? And so, um, I went, I, you know, I still, you know, we all go through uh, good days, bad days, but I try to keep a positive spirit. I, I, I'm, I have gratitude for being alive and I, I still have, I keep, well, now that we have COVID, that's another different whole issue altogether. But, you know, you, you make those phone calls to your friends. You do Zoom calls if you if you can, because everybody's on Zoom because of work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, you just have to just do whatever you can to um, keep yourself uplifted. I am a, a, work, a worker bee. <laughs> so, um... Work has always been a huge um, blessing in my life. Um, I've always loved my jobs and the people that I worked with. And so um, I started a, um, a, a entertainment company, actually, because of isolation. Um, you know, and the company was to get people out to socialize with their friends and their family in, in venues that were accessible by wheelchair or walker or such so that they didn't have to be home. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and you've done so quite a bit with those. It, um, to keep myself happy. You know, I, 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 um, you know I, I, I created events that I wanted to go to. I wanted to go to a concert, so I created a concert. Yeah, I yeah. To go to a comedy show, I created a comedy show. <laughs> you know, and that's what I did. Um, you know, and um, you're very good at that. You, you're very good at that. And I think what, um, I think what, what you're saying is to, that we need to figure out what we like to do and do that which which comes back to what jeff said which is um i can't do a lot but i'll do a lot of what i can but i think uh, you know i know i've told a story before on you know um in one of our episodes but one of the things that i did in the hospital was i love wearing high heels and i was suffering <laughs> with terrible fatigue <laughs> and i said to myself, you know and i said look at I want to wear high heels. I said, God, I want to wear high heels again. You're going to have to help me. God said, Jennifer, I got a couple other people I got to deal with. <laughs> I said, no, you know, no, no. You know what he said? He, he said I, know, I know you're joking, but you know what he said? We can do this. I said, we can do this. I said, okay. I remember the first time I put shoes on on my feet, they were like an inch and a half or maybe an inch and a, an inch um, tall. I was falling off of them. Because I had, I just, I, I didn't know how to walk with low heeled shoes. I'd, I had that spent decades in high heels, you know? And I remember falling off of these shoes. But I remember after months and months and months of not being able to put, you know, high heels on, I remember putting them on and holding onto the wall and walking in that two inch heel. And so, because I wanted to look beautiful, and for me, my beauty had to do with my shoes. And so I, I know it, it strokes of everything, but uh, I, 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 I would determine. Your, I think your beauty is a little bit more than your shoes, my dear. I think it's I, that beautiful smile of yours. <laughs> and it's nothing to do with your shoes. <laughs> You know, I mean, when, when you've had a stroke, you, you, your, your thinking gets really askew. And so I was like, I just really want to wear high heels again. I cannot, I'm, I refuse to give away all my high heels. I give away everything else, but I'm not giving away my high heels. And so, you know, uh, determination. 
And I'm telling you today, I wear higher heels than I ever did before stroke. My heels are like four inches tall and I wear them and I walk, I walk just fine. <laughs> so, you know, you, you have to, you have to figure out what it is. What is it? That find what brings you joy and just like, I am like, I, I love old school music. So I, when I'm, if I'm having a bad day, you're going to uh, hear some Method Man, some Mary J. Bly, and I'm going to be just moving and grooving. And that's what I do. Yeah. I dance yeah. in my house. Yeah. I think too, you know, I mean, the living life after stroke, um, it, it's, it's two parts because you have to figure out your finances and you've got to figure out what you want in life and where you want to go. So the financial part, you know, I, I mean, I, I talked about that already. Um, you know, Maria talked about, you know, uh, the, what motivates you? What is it that you want to do in life? But I think, um, I think if you don't accept who you are right this second as a survivor, if you refuse to accept that girl or that guy, right yeah, where you're she, never going to be who you were before. You cannot be who you were before. But no. if you refuse to accept the person that you are right this second, I am telling you, life will be hard just really 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 hard and um you know one of the things i always say to people and and it's a, it takes a few years before you accept that girl or that guy that new girl or that new boy that that boy but the, the way i explain it to, to survivors when they try to explain to me why it's so difficult and i say you know here we go you have pre-stroke you and you have post-stroke you and there's this bridge, but post-stroke you don't want post-stroke you. So nobody wants this girl over here or this guy over here. Everybody wants this guy over here, this guy here. But guess what? This guy is not budging. He's never going to budge. So can you at least meet him halfway? Can post-stroke girl go and meet pre-stroke girl halfway? And I am telling you, every single time post-stroke goes to meet pre-stroke, pre-stroke moves one inch further and they meet in the middle. But the, because a lot of people are stuck here and they refuse to accept this girl here, it's very hard for this pre-stroke person to meet you in the middle. So you gotta come, you, you gotta meet, yes, meet each not, other in the middle. It's not always just you. I mean, a lot of people, their partners have a hard time with that. Their partners mm -hmm. are having a difficult cha a challenge with accepting them as the new person that they are versus yeah. the person that they initially knew. And yeah. so learning, uh, having the people around you learn to accept your limitations and, um, and, um, you know, treat you, um, similar to tr treat you the way that you are now, yeah. you know, what I mean, you know, you can't do certain things anymore, but you can do other things. Yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. You can do a lot of what you can do. I mean, I, 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 I can't, I, I can't learn a, a new language. I, I mean, I'm tr really trying right now. I'm really, really trying hard to learn a, a new language. I can't put a puzzle together anymore, but guess what? I can put a five, seven or 12 piece puzzle together. So what do I do when my, my nieces and my nephews and my great nieces and nephews want to do a puzzle? I say, can we have, can we do the smaller one first? Because I'll be successful at the smaller one and then they can go ahead and do the bigger ones. You know, I can't lift my nieces and nephews for too long, but guess what I can do? I can sit on a couch and I can say to them, come and sit next to me and I can put them on my lap. Um, I can't hold a baby in my left arm because my left arm is very weak and I'm, I'm liable to drop, a ba I drop the baby or the, or, or the crystal glass. But what do I do? I hold a lot of things in my right hand. So we have to heighten what our strengths are post-stroke, and we have to appreciate that and look for ways of, of how to maximize that in order to live this life. And there is life after stroke. I mean, I, I Absolutely. just finished. I've had, I've, I'm, I've had, I'm having a pretty good life after stroke. I am having a pretty good life. I just came back from Europe. I walked 800 kilometers on the Camino Francis. Um, my backpack. Do what Jennifer can do, but I can do what Maria can do. There we go. A lot. I'm still very smart. I still have a lot of brain function. Um, so I, um, I just focus on the things that I can do. And I, in, I, I still enjoy socializing with my friends. I just do it in a different capacity, which everybody now has to do anyway, because of this vibe, the pandemic. 
So um, and, you, know, you just have to find joy where you find it. And, and you know, I find joy in music. I find joy in sometimes just listening to a TED talk. You know, I like to I like to keep learning. Um, you know, so just figuring out what you what you enjoy. And I think a big part of it too is volunteering. You know, I volunteer quite a bit. I've always volunteered. At first, I volunteered to keep my skills up because I had intentions of re returning to work. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized that I cannot return to the, the job I did before, I kept on volunteering and added to my volunteer, you know, my, 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 my volunteer um, repertoire. But I do a lot of volunteer work. I volunteer with March of Dimes. I, march, I volunteer with the Lynn. I, I volunteer with, um, with Mass University, with, um, you know, um, Hamilton Health Sciences. I do a lot, a lot of this. There's, there's a great need for volunteers out there, especially volunteers with our limitations, because we're the ones that know this stuff. And so I, I find that a lot of people don't volunteer when they've had a stroke. I, I do not volunteer because I'm an, I, I struggle to walk. Yeah. Um, I struggle to, um, you know, I don't have the use of my left hand. Yeah, you know, so of course. Me, and I don't, I can't drive. Yeah, of so course. I, I don't, um, you know, for me to get into a taxi these days, you have to sit in the back seat. Yeah. I, I have, I'm five, nine and a half. So I got to drag myself across the back seat. I got to try to grab onto the bar. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not easy for me to get in and out and about. So I'm not volunteering because I, just because it's not convenient for me. And, and that's and, and a lot of, of um, stroke survivors can't volunteer in the physical aspect of things because like you said there's physical limitations but for, <clears throat> excuse me for people like myself who don't have that physical limitations what I do is I volunteer my brain so what I do is for example a lot of things has moved online so I host a peer support group on zoom I uh, go to attend board meetings um, you know, I, I can do that in person. I can do uh, uh, advisory groups on, on, on Zoom. You know, these are the things I can do. I can meet a survivor for coffee and, and, and if they have problems getting financial aid, those kinds of things, I can do that. If a survivor says, you know, my family doesn't understand, can you help my family? I can meet with the family. I can meet with the medical team to help them to fill out their ODSP forms. These are the things, but because I still suffer with fatigue, everybody knows that as soon as I get there, get, hand me a chair because I'll sit down. And that's very important. That's very important to me volunteering with you. And so um, I think volunteer work, but I think a lot of us stroke survivors, um, they've lost, um, you know, their, their self-esteem has taken a hit with stroke. And so they feel like they have nothing to offer. And it's quite the opposite because you're the guy that knows what it feels like to have a stroke. You are the best person to host a peer support group. You are the best person to sit with someone's family and explain, this is what's going on with your daughter. This is what's going on with your son. This is what's going on with your husband. You are the absolute best person to put into words what most survivors what can't. My symptoms are not the same as the other person's symptoms. Exactly. Like, what, if they did, what if they had a brain bleed stroke? I had, a, I had an ischemic stroke, you know? So how do I interact with that person and talk about stroke when I know nothing about the hemorrhagic stroke. I don't know. I've, 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 my husband and I, and, and now I do, you know, have um, got, um, chaired uh, peer support groups. And we find that there is not a, a big difference between the two. The only difference is the medical terminology. Brain damage is brain damage is brain damage, I find. So the person that's had the well, brain bleed. There's people who have to have brain surgery, and then there's people who don't have to have brain surgery. That's correct. That's correct. And then there's other people that are that still have brain bleeds that are being cauterized, and they too have brain damage. So although they haven't had the surgery, although they haven't had a stroke, they have these brain brain bleeds that are sort of like little fissures and little balloons in their brain, but it's causing brain damage still. So when the brain gets damaged, I find that brain damage whether it be a ischemic stroke, whether it be a brain bleed, whether it be a hemorrhagic stroke, whatever it is, the brain damage is, it looks the exact same. And so I find that um, those kinds of uh, things, brain, da brain damage just, um, our, our self-esteem takes a hit when it comes to brain damage, because we can see ourselves 
you know, acting very differently and speaking very differently. And we get very self-conscious. But I think, um, I think if we as stroke survivors were to say, look at, I'm not the, the, the girl I used to be pre-stroke, but guess what? I am different and I'm okay with that. And I am different good. I am different good. And I'm different amazing. If we were to just acknowledge that we're different yes. good, you know, I think that would move mountains and then we'll really yeah, start friends of all mine things. Tell me that they say, Maria, you're you're great. You're great. Yeah. Don't worry about the fact that you can't necessarily walk or whatever. You're still um the same go-getter kind of person. You still have the same personality, but that's coming to me. This is over time. Like, I mean, I'm not gonna say within the first year or two that you're gonna be able to find who you are. I mean, it, it, I'm five years in, so it's taken me five years to get to a place where I know who I am now, I accept who I am now, and I do the best with what I can now. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And yeah. that person, the old Maria, um, yeah, as much as I love her, and I wish I could, you know, uh, there are times when I wish I could do the things that she used to do that I took for granted, um, she's not here anymore. <laughs> and that's the truth. She's and not here, so I gotta, you know, I gotta just, you know, live my new life. And she, and, and she's not there. But guess who's taking over? Awesome Maria, <laughs> who, <laughs> awesome Maria, who is providing all kind. Maria, you know what? T tell people what you do. Tell people all the things you've started in the last five years and the things that you've spearheaded and you continue to govern. Just talk about that. It's okay, been fun. Well, I am. Um... You know, like I said, I'm a worker bee person. Um, so I started a company called um, Interior Home Redesign, which is a company that assists people when they leave the hospital or, or the rehab center to um, make their homes accessible. So if they have carpet, they can't use carpet. They have to put hardwood floors in. You know, we build ramps so that they can get into their homes. I mean, you spend 30, 30 years paying for this home. Why should you go live in a nursing home? You know, so, um, you know, we try to make your home accessible. We yeah. try to make it safe for you. So we put in, um, um, we put in, um, bath bars, bathtub chairs, you know, we put in the raised toilet seats. You know? and, and Alicia, can we put, can we put the name of that company in the comments as well? And Maria, you've got yeah. several companies that you've started, um, so there's there's the um the home home fitting a company what's the other companies that you've started okay i have accessible home um sorry accessible event management group which is my company that does events in accessible venues so i go to the venue um because a lot of venues will say they're accessible just because you can get in their door so i have to go to the venue talk to the management, let them know you have to fix the bathroom. The bathroom has to have bars on both sides because not everybody's right or left-handed, you know, um, at this point. You have to make sure you have good lighting. You have to make sure that you, where, you, where you're going to the washroom is accessible by ramp, you know. So I, I go to the places and I try to encourage them to make their businesses accessible. So and that's two, that, then, that, that's two companies. So tell me about the the, the third one. Um, accessible home redesign. I uh, know. The ramps. Um, no, I, I so, so the, the, interior, the, interior uh, moving specialist mm -hmm. is just moving things around in the house. Like if you need to put your bed downstairs because you can't do the stairs, so we will move your move, we will re reorganize your home to ensure that. You know, maybe your bedroom now has to be on the main floor. And what's that company called? Interior Home, mo mo Interior Moving Specialists. So and that's three. That hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And three of them. There's a fourth one. Um, that's Accessible that Home started. Redesign. Yeah. And so you also maybe um, not making sure that your shower doesn't have a lip so you don't yeah. have to step up to get into yeah. the shower. So it's just, um, you know, you can just walk into the shower, um, you know, so we have, I have, I have construction teams that do that work. And, and you I, also you know, started, I just oversee. And you also started Conversations in the Den. Yes. And then Conversations in the Den 
was something that I always wanted to do because I, I always wanted to speak to survivors, but I initially thought I would be speaking to them in my den. But then COVID happened, so now I'm speaking to them on Zoom. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> you know, because I just Great. think that, you know, we all need to um, speak to each other. Um, there's so many people that, um, it, it's crazy, Jennifer. It's yeah. crazy, everyone. Um, yesterday, I had a guy come to fix my dishwasher. And the people that I have met since I had this stroke, um, I hired a, a virtual assistant. She ended up having had been a person who had been in a car accident and had her spine fused. Like wow. God just brings people into your life. Yesterday, yeah. the guy came to fix my dishwasher. He said he broke his back and he wow. couldn't walk. I mean, wow. I mean, we just ended up having this conversation and we, yeah. we were speaking about all these things and, you know, it's just very interesting. He was, he was a young guy and he said that, you know, he couldn't, he was, he would try to walk up the um, stairs, the, um, you know, the Wentworth stairs in Hamilton where, during the, where the trails are. And he said people would be passing him and he, he couldn't even function. And this is a guy that was young. Like he was like about 30 years old. Yeah. And you know, I end up in these conversations and, and my friends always say, how do you get into people's business? <laughs> I wasn't getting in his business. You're he friendly. Said, You're friendly. I said, no, I had a stroke. And yeah. he said, oh, I understand. Um, I broke my back. You yeah. know, and um, I don't even remember how he broke his back, to be honest, because I, um, I just got the part that he broke his back and he couldn't walk. But I think so one of the things that... He would what... never work again. And now he's doing a different job than the job he was doing before his back broke. He's, um, you know, repairing, doing repairs. Like he basically um, came in, like just fixed the filter in my dishwasher and, yeah. you know, talked, told me, you know, I was overloading it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Maria, I think one of the things that's, 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 that's good with survivors like you and I is that we're, we're authentic. We have nothing to hide. You know, if it if it affects us, we just tell you. We don't. We don't. We, we are not in the business of looking good. We are done with that. Oh, girl, you know? I want to look good. Don't go there. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean looking good yeah, physically. No, 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 I'm not trying to represent and be something that I'm not. No. Exactly. And so we're not in the business of impressing anybody. It no. is what it is. And we just say it and we talk about it. Um, you know, I, I, I wish we could save some more on, on that subject. But Alicia, we have one more question, don't we? Yeah, and I think Maria started getting into it a little bit with the home redesign and the moving company is what assistive devices do you use? Or if you're not currently using any, when you when do you used in the past? Okay. Um, initially, for the first two years, I was in a wheelchair. Um, I could not walk. Um, I couldn't even, I remember being in the hospital and actually I have a video recording of it. The first time that they put me in the harness and I just fell to the side because I didn't have any balance. You know, but you, it, over time, you know, you're doing, I was doing physio and in, um, in the rehab hospital and eventually I learned how to balance myself. But also in the hospital, this nurse, and I believe I've mentioned him before, his name was Peter. And he told me, he said, Maria, when I come in here at two o'clock in the afternoon, I don't want to see you in the bed because if you're sitting up, at least you, you're getting some, you're helping with your balance. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. from then I never, ever, ever laid in that bed all day. Yeah. I would always just sit in the chair. So people, when people came to visit me, they would see me sitting in the chair. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, so, um, I currently use a, a, a cane. Now my cane is a single point cane. But I do put a, um, I do uh, attach a, uh, a, a, like a, a little thing on the bottom um, to, um, for safety because, you know, if you fall outside, like who's helping you? Like, I'm, yeah. I live by myself. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I spend most of my time by myself, except when I'm with you lovely ladies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um. I, you know, I have to stay safe. I mean, I have fallen in my apartment and had to call 911. Yeah. You know, I've gone through all those things because I was on the wrong medication. Um, I've had a seizure. Um, you know, so, um, you know, there are different things, but um, basically I just use, uh, I use a cane at this point. I no longer use um, a wheelchair. 
In fact, I gave away my wheelchair. My friend's father had a stroke a couple weeks ago, and I said oh, to him, don't I'm even sorry. think about buying a wheelchair. I got one. Oh, and that's so one. nice of you. Those things are expensive. So that's so nice of you to do that. I'm sorry to hear about your friend, too. That's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, you know? Well, I'm, a, I'm very blessed. Um, you know, working at the university, I'm, I'm, on, I'm actually on medical leave from the university. Um, so I still get um, a long-term disability pay, which yeah. is a, a portion of my paycheck. So I'm yeah. not on any government assistance. So, yeah, I, um, you know, I didn't pay for that wheelchair. My yeah, insurance me. paid for it. Yeah. So I didn't think, you know, she offered me money for the wheelchair. And I said to her, are you crazy? That's so very you kind of you. That's your family, yeah. they're from Newfoundland, and they are the kindest, most loving people. Wow. And I thought, oh gosh, whatever I can do to help. Amen, amen. And all I was doing was taking up room in my laundry room anyways. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so glad you did that. That's awesome. Yeah, so I think for me, where it comes to assistive devices, um, I still have um, memory issues. So I use my phone quite often. So if I'm on the phone and the doctor is making an appointment with me, I put them on speaker right away. I switch to my calendar and I put the appointment in the calendar right away. If someone is on the phone and they give me instructions, I tell them to hold on and I switch to, I have a notebook on my phone. I switch to my notebook and I start writing right away as they're speaking because I will forget when I get off the phone. Wow. So I have to do it, I have to do it right away. Times I've changed my pa pa banking password. Lord, <laughs> oh Lord, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they're gonna block my number. <laughs> and, and so I have, uh, on my phone, I have a password keeper. It keeps all of my password. I forget my passwords all the time. I am in my password keeper daily, daily, because there's different things that I do online that, that has a password. There's banking information that has a password. There's credit card that has a, a password. There is notes that have a password, whatever. There's password for my husband's uh, business, my husband's things. So I have a password keeper on my phone that keeps all of my password. Very, very simple to open. Um, I also What's the name um, of that again. I'm sorry. What was the name of that? It's called Passkey. And Passkey? when when they first, I'm gonna turn K E Y I'm gonna, or K E E P. I'm gonna pull it up so that I can show it here. Oh, sorry, I I I made a mistake. It's called e wallet, and I'll show you oh, what it looks no, like. If, now you're confusing me. <laughs> it's called if if you look at it if you look at it right it's right here. Uh, where's my camera? right there it's okay well let's move it back anyway it's called e-wallet e-w-a-l-l-e-t oh, okay. -E now when this when this app first came out you know 10 years ago it was free and so i downloaded it on my phone but in the last two years the app is so popular and so foolproof and so safe that people want to use it. And so they're now they're charging a small fee to use it. However, it's grandfathered, meaning therefore I don't get to pay. But when you download it, you might have to pay a few dollars. But mm -hmm. eWallet e is my password keeper. It's amazing, love it. I've had it for 10 years or more. Um, I would say that those are my assistive devices. Um, the other thing I do, you know, is um, I don't write down directions, I use my my google uh, maps, google maps. Uh, and my google directions all the time so if i get in the car even if i'm going to somewhere that i'm familiar with i don't necessarily remember how to get there effectively so most often when you get into my car you would see that i have google google maps on and you would see that i'm ta i'm taking directions from the girl that's speaking on on, on directions <laughs> so <laughs> you what's know her name? um what's her name Siri. I, I, I just call her the girl, that girl. <laughs> that girl talks and I listen. But you know, you adapt, you know, you adapt. And for example, you know, I don't, um, I don't plan a day of constantly doing stuff. I have to build in some, you know, for, for example, um, I'm going to meet my girls tonight after the show, but I've had a whole day of, you know, resting and doing things. So I, I do not plan a day of 7 a.m. to you know, 10 p.m. anymore. I can't do that, my body can't handle it. So it's not possible, 
you know, so I don't, I set myself up for success every single day in yeah. how I deal with and my you're day. You're not getting any younger either. So it's yep. not even, um, you know, it's not even just the stroke. I mean, we're, um, you know, even though you look 25, Jen, I know you're like over 40. <laughs> Thank you, girl. But listen, Jeff used to say, he used to say, um, Dr. Shkoski said to him one time, he said, he, he was complaining to Dr. Shkoski about, I don't know what he was. And Dr. Shkoski looks at him and he goes, Jeff, he says, you've had a stroke, right? He goes, yeah. He says, and you're getting old, right? He goes, yeah. He says, well, double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm 51. So, I'm 51, and I'm I'm um, you know, I'm I'm pr proud that I've got to be 51. Yeah. yeah. Um, my 50th birthday celebration was uh, it was like I was back in the old days. I was dancing, I was grooving, I was having a good time, and that's me. I just make the best of every moment. Yeah, yeah. You have to. You have to. And you know, I mean, where it comes to, you know. Uh, you, you know, just living life, we have to learn to adapt. We have to learn to adapt with what we have. We have to look at ourselves it's sober, with sober judgment and go, can I pull off a 12 hour day like I did before pre-stroke? And if the answer is no, then you have to adapt. If you look at your finances and you go, can I travel to Spain for three months? And the answer is no, then you adapt. So you don't go to Spain, you go to a cottage for a week. Um, if you, you know, if you can't speak, if you've got aphasia and you want to communicate, can I still write? Okay, I'm going to carry a notebook around and I'm going to get that app where I can, I can tell it quickly what I want to say and I'll carry it around. You know, um, I was in Spain and I don't speak Spanish and I have an app on my phone where I speak into my phone and it translates into Spanish. So you know what, I, I had so many friends that speak Spanish and did not speak English. So this is what we were doing. We would grab our phone and we would type, 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 and we would hit speak. And then we would go like this. And then the other person would grab their phone and they would type, 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 type. And then they would <laughs> hit play. And so we communicated like this. We shoved our phones in each other's faces back and forth and so if you don't if you have aphasia get the app you know type 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 hit speak um if you can't walk because you know one side doesn't work do what maria does you know rehab 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 until you get to the point of look at yeah, um, every day for an hour the only day i do not do physio is actually on wednesday wednesday i do nothing but this podcast that's all i do on wednesdays my husband used to say, as a stroke survivor, you have one job. It's the first job and it's the most important, rehab. Your first order of the day is rehab. Everything has to come after. Your first job every single day, no matter how far into your stroke you are, is rehab. Whether it be going for a walk, whether it be reading a book, whether it be a quiet time, whether it be listening to something that, that motivates you, whether it be calling a friend, whether it be taking a walk around your apartment because it's COVID. He says every single stroke survivor has one job that's very, very important every single day. You yeah. don't have anything else that's more important than rehab. And so that is our job. Our job is to rehab. And if you, yeah. but uh, if you let that's rehab the walk that away. That I actually have unlimited physio for my job. Mm. So I can have physio every day and I do. Amen, amen. I think that's it and that's a wrap. Uh, thank you for asking the questions. Uh, we're glad you joined yes, us. We are glad. We'll give you the best answers we can. We are not doctors. Yes. We are living, uh, we are survivors. We are yeah. just, like, just like you, we are surviving this. We are learning and believe me, we know more than, not me personally, but I'm saying us as survivors know more than the doctors know sometimes because they have all these preconceived ideas that they got from their medical book. You know, um, I was on a, a site the other day, um, a, a um, stroke group, and um, the person said um, that they, they were told that um, after three months that you plateaued. And I said, I completely disagree with that. Me too. Um, I am five years in and I'm still progressing because I'm constantly working on it. 
So I'm yeah. still progressing. Like actually inside my condo, I actually walk without my cane. Yeah. I only use my cane when I'm outside. Yeah. No, I agree. I, we, we, one of the most important things I did for myself after my stroke is to uh, become a part of a stroke group because that was very important to me because it was very important to boost my self-esteem to see people just like myself, you know, and to see them talking about themselves and see them, you know, integrating into society. It was very, very important to, to boost my self-esteem. And so I always say to people, go to a stroke group, but you don't have to go forever. Go to the first the, the first couple of meetings. Once you feel like your self-esteem has, uh, has been boosted, just go do your own thing. I've, we've, in the 10 years that, um, you know, I have overseen the Hamilton Young Stroke Survivors Group, I see people come, they participate, their self-esteem takes it, uh, goes up like notches. And what do they do? They leave and they go and they volunteer elsewhere. I have I have survivors who not, who who has been volunteering at libraries. I have volunteers. I have um, survivors who left to volunteer with smaller groups because they come and they see that it's possible, and then they go, "I'm going to go do something I want to do," and so they go out and they do something. So come go to a stroke survivors meeting, um, get your self esteem built back up, volunteer in a safe environment. I always always ask people in my group to volunteer. Volunteer in yeah, our group. Me, um, I have to say, Jennifer, that going to the Young Stroke Survivors Group and having the conversations was what gave me the inspiration to start the Accessible Event Management Group. Oh, man, I'm so Where glad. I knew that people were in isolation and I felt that's so unfair. Yeah. Why? Yeah. They didn't do this. This is something yeah. that happens. Yeah. And so Absolutely. why should they now be left in isolation? They can't go out and socialize. Yeah. You know, and no. so this is why I started the company. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Well, listen, uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, we are out of time. Maria, thanks for sharing. Uh, Alicia, thanks for guiding us. And um, I'm going to say goodbye. And we'll see you guys next week. See you guys next week.